Welcome to the Final Girls podcast. This is Anna, co-founder of the Final Girls Collective and your podcast host. If you're new to the show, every season we explore the intersections of horror film and feminism, looking at a particular trope in depth and how it's been presented throughout horror film history. We're going to be spending the next couple of months talking about the most elegant and the horniest of movie monsters, the vampire. In each episode, I'm joined by a special guest to dive deep into a vampire movie or two. We discuss the films in detail, sometimes make terrible pun jokes, and try to contextualize them and think about what works and what doesn't. In today's episode, we continue in the 1970s with two very different films that somehow kind of work together as a double bill. Firstly, we cover the unclassifiable horror gem, Let's Scare Jessica to Death. Newly released from a mental ward, Jessica hopes to return to life the way it was before her nervous breakdown. But when she moves to a country house with her husband and a close friend, she finds a mysterious girl living in there who may or may not be a vampire. And in the second part of this episode, we go into a very particular blend of the erotic and the horrific with Vampiros Lesbos, a 1971 film by the ultra-prolific Spanish filmmaker Jess Franco. In this film, Linda Westinghouse is troubled by a recurring dream in which she's seduced by a gorgeous vampire. Sent to a small island for work, she meets and is seduced by Countess Nadine Carady, a beautiful nightclub owner whom she immediately recognizes as a seductress from her dreams. If you've never encountered a Jess Franco film before, this is a good one to start with. There's a lot of nudity, some very dodgy psychiatrists, and even a disco Dracula. I'm joined in this episode by the editor-in-chief of Diabolique magazine, author and film critic Kat Ellinger to discuss both films in depth and give us a taste for the films of Jess Franco. This entire season is made possible thanks to the support of our video, who bring you the very best in cult, horror and genre films, specializing in deluxe home entertainment editions. Their collection now spans more than 500 titles, and throughout the season, we'll be recommending a film that we love from their vast collection of releases. This week, our pick is Hagazusa, A Heathen's Curse, an eerie and visually stunning film that looks at witchcraft through the story of an isolated woman in the 15th century, an outcast in a society twisted in deep-rooted superstitions and misogyny. If you're new to this podcast, please know that we discuss the films in detail from pretty much the very beginning. We don't really spoil the endings of Let's Scare Jessica to Death and Vampiros Lesbos in this episode until the very end of our discussions about each. But if you are averse to any conversation about a film that you haven't seen, please consider this your spoiler wording. If you don't really mind and you need to be convinced to check these films out, then please enjoy our discussion about these two gems from the 70s. Kat, welcome back. It's been a week. Yes. (laughs) I can't not invade the vampire season, though. You're very welcome to invade it. (laughs) Um, I'm really chuffed to be talking about these two films that we're gonna co- that we're gonna cover in this episode because in our the previous time you were on the podcast we were talking about um, lesbian vampire films from the 70s and these are at least one of them is kind of part of that subgenre. Yeah, totally. And the other one totally. is something a little bit more unclassifiable, I'd say. Yeah, it's still like a bit of a riff on Carmina, though, as well. So it's all connected. As I know we discussed it on the last mm. episode, how it was part of a big boom in the early 70s when they suddenly realised that women actually made quite good vampires. <laughs> so let's get into the first of the two films that we're going to be chatting about in this episode. And let's begin with Let's Scare Jessica to Death from 1971 on all the spirits of everyone who's ever died in this house. Jessica. I'm calling on all the spirits of everyone who's ever died in this house. Jessica. Paramount Pictures presents Let's Scare Jessica to Death. Why 
Had you been following me? What's the matter with her? She knows who killed that man. What man? I don't know. He was lying right here. But I swear it's true. No! I think that the same creature or, or whatever it is that killed the ant did do it to them all. I think you should go back to New York for a while. You can see your doctor. <laughs> I was just, uh, looking at the picture. Looks so much like you. My eyes, look at my eyes. Come with me, come. Come with me. Follow me, Jessica. Follow me. I absolutely love this film. So tell me about your relationship with this film. Why? When did you first see it and, and what made you love it so much? Oh God, I hate it when people say, when did you first see it? It all blurs into one. Um, I just think it's such a strange film mm. and, it, and it seems to belong to, um, and this isn't a disparaging comment, but mm. American horror by and large tends to be quite commercial or formulaic. But mm. there's this little undercurrent of independent horror. Mm. And it comes out in this from the sixties and into the seventies, where you get these really strange films being made, mm-hmm. like really weird. Like you said, they're like unclassifiable. Mm-hmm. Messiah of Evil is another one. Carnival of Souls. Yes, and they just sort of inhabit this really strange energy. And mm. I saw this one. You know, I can't remember now, but I saw this. After I saw Messiah of Evil, Mm -hmm. I think. And it just clicked in my head that it was part of this strange little subgenre, which Mm. I already had a taste for. And I just think it's such a a unique riff on the vampire. Mm. Just the whole energy of it. It's just got this amazing energy. And it's in that respect, it's more like a European film. Mm. Uh, apart from it has this wonderful American Gothic backdrop as well to it. But I just think it's wonderful. It's just such a one-off. And I know it's got like a big cult base. in, in it, ha- And especially now it's had a Blu-ray yeah. fan base. But it's also a film that sort of stays off a lot of people's radars for whatever reason. Yeah, it's sort of a, a kind of a... Uh, a little hidden gem even for horror fans where it the, uh, some of the imagery from this film I think I probably saw the image of um, Abigail Bishop kind of lifting herself up from the lake before I saw the film so I was familiar with choice images from the from Let's Go Check let's scare Jessica to death before I actually knew what the film was about or had even seen it which is kind of this weird cult uh, status that it has where you kind of recognize it but before you even know what it what it is about and it's already got an aura of creepiness about it yeah the title doesn't really give much away either it doesn't really tell you that it's you know a gothic film or a vampire film i think like you i'd heard the title uh and it the title just sounds like I don't know, just one of those 70s thrillers. Mm. Like, you know, (laughs) it doesn't really inspire you to go rushing out to watch it. But it's, um, yeah, such an oddity. It's such a brilliant oddity. And you mentioned before that it kind of stands out uh, compared to other American horror films from the era. And what do you think makes it such a standalone weird film compared to other films that were coming out at the time? I think because it's just so ambiguous and it kind of uses the fantastique. Without jumping ahead too much, we have this woman, the titular Jessica, and you're not entirely sure whether what she's seeing is some sort of hysterical manifestation or whether there really are vampires. You just don't know. And generally a lot of or the more mainstream American horror, especially from this period where it had gone really Mm hyper-realistic and more into the exploitation bracket, you know, with The Last House on the left and Mm -hmm. then 
a little bit later on, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, it got really gritty, really hyper-realistic and moved away from gothic and genres like that. Mm. And it kind of stands out from that because it's got this real dreamy quality. It's just so ambiguous. I think Messiah of Evil, as I mentioned, is like another one like that. Carnival of Souls is Mm. definitely like that. Where it exists in this strange no man's land and you you don't generally see that f- coming from america uh, during this period it was more of an, a european thing like it's totally normal to expect it in a like i don't know jean roland mm-hmm. film for example uh you totally go in expecting it so when i first got to this mm. um and i hadn't read a lot about it or heard a lot about it like I'd seen the poster maybe Mm -hmm. and I'd seen the name come up in various books but I didn't really know much about it I I just wasn't expecting the film that I got (laughs) I thought maybe it was about a a group of teens who sort of you know had gone out on a road trip and were playing a horrible prank on the Jessica in the title like I just it kind of makes you think of that, especially the poster as well with mm. the little skeleton hands and the and the boat. It looks more like a thriller. Yeah. And it just, yeah, I don't think anything prepares you for it. And there's not really anything in the genre to say, oh, well, it's like this and it's like that and it's like this because it's not like anything... Not in that sub-genre at all, like nothing. Because even when we talked about Daughters of Darkness, Mm -hmm. which is quite an ambiguous film and it uses the fantastique, it still belongs to a specific canon. Yeah. Whereas Let's Scare Jessica to Death belongs more to the, the bracket of thrillers that used hysteria, like female hysteria as a, as a, undertone for their main protagonist so Mm. it's yeah but then it has elements of Carmilla I don't think that was intentional um it was inspired by the gothic things Mm. like Henry James for example so it has that kind of strange uh, the turn of the screw is like a very ambiguous story so it has that to it but Yes, it's just such a wonderful film. I want to talk about the the literary influences in a bit because I also um, got tinges there of the yellow wallpaper. Yes. Um, I wanted to chat first about our protagonist, Jessica, who's so much the source of a lot of the ambiguity that you mentioned because she's very much in... We're seeing all of the all of the plot of the film unfold from her point of view, don't we? Yeah, and she is the typical gothic and reliable narrator. Mm. So, because, and it even sort of bookends the film with her sort of looking back, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So, we know that we're going in seeing things from her point of view and there's nothing else in there that corroborates what she's seeing or not. So, depending on whether you want to believe that there's vampires, which I do, obviously, <laughs> or not, the, the, the story could have mm-hmm. two very different meanings. Mm. And the second one, which would make it more of a realistic horror film, would be horrific mm. when you think, <laughs> you think what happens at the end. Yeah. And what do you make of, of her as a character um, herself? Because when we meet her, she's just been she's just come out of a nervous breakdown. I think they call it that in the film. And it's very also undefined. Uh, but everyone is kind of tiptoeing around her when they go to this cabin in the woods. Yeah, and that's like a very literary thing, mm. like you said. It's it's the it's goes right right back to traditional Gothic, where you have these heroines who were slightly hysterical mm. or very very vulnerable, like newlyweds, for example. But they really do hammer it home. This like oh, she's just come out of hospital and she's mm-hmm. been hearing voices. Like they really kind of run that in but mm. it's the typical gaslight narrative it goes yes. back to the and i love the 
the Victorian or the period based mm -hmm. melodramas that Hollywood did, for example, mm -hmm. in the 40s, you know, like Rebecca is another one mm -hmm. where you generally have this female protagonist who isn't quite sure what she's seeing is she losing her mind and obviously Jessica in this is they're they're very specific that she's literally just left a mental institution mm. so it it already sets things up to be biased in in one way but they never really tells you, well, yes, this is what happens, <laughs> which I love. In, in the same way with the with the vampire reading of the film, when I was putting together the, the list of films to cover in the season, I was going back and forth on this film because I kept wondering, even to myself, having seen it, is this actually a vampire film? I'd say it was. I always call it a vampire film. And I, I think it is as well, but I wonder... How do you think it uses the the vampire storyline or the vampire imagery in the film? I think like Daughters of Darkness, which we discussed on the last episode I was in, mm. the, the director, John Hancock, really resists using this formulaic stuff with the fangs and everything we mm. what we get instead are clues so you've got like the townspeople yes you all have these mysterious injuries on their neck mm. and uh and i love the way that he uses the townspeople as this strange army they're very suspicious always films them in, in close up of their faces they're quite grotesque but it's the, the Jessica is the only one that seems to notice that. Mm. And so Hancock, I guess, trusts his audience to put two and two together and make four. He gives us these tiny little clues that we would associate with the vampire, but he doesn't come in with, like Daughters of Darkness, with some Van Helsing character giving us the whole rundown on you know, this is a vampire and this is what we have to do to destroy it. Like, I, I don't think yeah. it's ne the word's never mentioned. Mm. And they're often the best vampire films, I think, when, when they don't mention the word vampire. And what do you make of um, the, the vampire character in this film, uh, Emily slash Abigail Bishop and, and her performance? I mean, she's wonderful because she's kind of like the femme fatale. She, d of course, this could all be in Jessica's mind as well. So it, mm. so it uses things like jealousy, insecurity. So what we're seeing of of this character is what Jessica is like. Her interpretation is this mm. cuckoo in the nest. Um, and that's where it comes close to Carmina. Of yes. course, in Carmina, it's uh, the relationship between the two women, mm -hmm. or the, the, the girl and the vampire, and there aren't any men around. But mm -hmm. when men are put into the mix, like Jessica's husband, mm -hmm. it generates all this tension and jealousy, and she's looking at her husband, looking at this woman. So again, we're very manipulated in what we should think mm -hmm. about Abigail because we already think she's a bit of a bitch before <laughs> it's revealed she might have she might be a bit more sinister mm. than that. But the character is just so claustrophobic and sinister in a way that openly vampire characters you know, as soon as somebody's revealed as a vampire, we know mm. what they're going to do. We know mm -hmm. they're going to come in and try and bite someone. And, uh, and of course, I love that, but it doesn't really give much mystery, does it? And we don't know what Abigail's going to do. Like the scene where she tries to drown Jessica and then plays it off as a game. I mean, that is just seriously creepy. Seriously, just, oh. It's creepy, I think, because there is that element of Jessica also allowing her into that space because she's the one that um, convinces the other ones to let her stay. So she's kind of a, opening up the door for Abigail to take over their dynamic and get closer to her um, until she realizes the danger that she's in. 
and kind of that toing and froing and flirting with with the vampire or with the vampiric figure is one of the things as well that makes it at least for me so compelling because you don't know if how much just does Jessica knowingly allow her to get close to her yeah because she's kind of she's kind of like drawn to mm. to Abigail as well she's like kind of weirdly obsessed with her yes and so on one hand she's frightened of her uh, but on the other, she can't leave her alone. Like, even after she sees her husband looking at her and she starts to feel a bit jealous. Um, there is another reading of that, though. It's almost mm-hmm. as if she's testing the husband. Ah. Um, because it's almost as if she sets him up. Yeah. To fulfil her expectations, which are obviously low yeah. at this point. <laughs> And um, you mentioned Carmilla and the turn of the screw a little bit before. Um, but I was wondering kind of how do you think the film takes bits and pieces from Carmilla, from Henry James, from the yellow wallpaper as well of of this idea of a woman being constricted and slowly losing her mind and being gaslit by uh, by people around her? I think it owes much more of a debt to the yellow wallpaper than Turn of the Screw. Mm. It definitely has that the ambiguity of the Turn of the Screw. And it has that weird sort of energy. Um, and obviously when we got to the film version of the Turn of the Screw in 1960, that became like sexual repression. Yeah. Um, like much, much more prominently. And so it uses all these things, this idea of hysteria and uh, and sexual repression. Like I love all of these things. They're like <laughs> my favourite things. It uses the idea of a main protagonist, like the yellow wallpaper, who is slowly becoming obsessed mm. with things. Although it's not explicit, you just see it in the way that she looks at Abigail or Emily as, as, uh, as she's... That's like the Carmela thing where they've got the two names, mm-hmm. Emily and Abigail. It sort of uses that and you're looking at this character through this this character who may or may not be going insane. I think the thing that these films do overall, and you mm-hmm. see it a lot in the gothic melodrama, so like Rebecca and gaslight specifically i mean that's where the word gaslighting comes from where you have uh, based on a play by patrick hamilton but there's the two film versions i slightly favor the ingrid bergman one because i love her <laughs> but you have this very sort of uh, vulnerable victorian mm-hmm. woman who's newly wed and she is driven out of her mind and it's all from her perspective so it uses the gaslighting aspect amazingly. And it's there's always this line in... Um, it's quite weird, actually, because I'm working on a blog for Patreon, which is semi-connected, but not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but just something I noticed. In, yeah. uh, basically, the essay is on some of the British Uncanny TV episodes. Uh-huh. Um, and I only realised this before I came to record today. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, it's all connected. The Sobbing Woman, mm-hmm. which I don't know if you've seen that. It's part of the Dead of Night series. No, I haven't. Um, absolutely brilliant. They're all like one hour things. Mm-hmm. The Nigel Neal's Beast series, the one where you have a pregnant woman who moves into this new farmhouse. And then also Nigel Neal's The Stone Tape. And in each of those, you've got three very intuitive women who see danger, either supernatural ghosts or in the sobbing woman, it's that this wife Mm -hmm. hears this woman crying, but nobody else can hear it. Mm -hmm. Um, And in the stone tape, it's Jane Asher's character who can hear uh, this ghost first and all these male scientists are kind of like, calm down, woman. (laughs) Uh, and let's scare Jessica to death really fits into that same Mm -hmm. genre where it's so easy I think to gaslight women and consider them a little bit too sensitive or Mm -hmm. did you really think that you saw that or is that what you really heard and so you see a lot of the male characters 
doing that to Jessica, mm. sort of, you know, say, oh, this must be the, you know, this is just your mental illness. And a very similar thing happens in The Sobbing wo Woman, where it's like, you know, we'll just take a pill, dear. Um, and, and I know there's like, it's like a double-edged sword. On one hand, you could say, well, women aren't that vulnerable. And so, you know, it's sort of disempowering to make them so vulnerable. But I think what it does in, in doing things like that, especially in Jessica, is it exposes how easy it is to to really gaslight women or to not believe them. Mm. And I think that's one of the things that I love about that genre. Even in the 40s, you know, under Hayes Code Hollywood, you have films coming out that really expose how easy it is for women to become embroiled in domestic violence and mm. why they don't leave. Even though the films aren't explicit, it shows you that. And so if we look at it that from that point of view, you know, Jessica is this very vulnerable woman, like the protagonist in The Yellow Wallpaper, mm -hmm. whose husband thinks he knows what's best for her. Yeah. And every time she tries to tell him, you know, this isn't right, I don't feel right, I don't feel comfortable with this, she's just silent. Mm -hmm. She's just, oh, you know, just go and calm down. And I just... I think it's used brilliantly here and it does go back to that whole kind of very gothic literary, the, the sort of gothic romances where, you know, the Anne Radcliffe's and that where you mm -hmm. have young women, it's more like a bluebeard motif sort of, you know, they get married or whatever and then there's a mystery around wherever they're li living but nobody takes them seriously. Mm. Um if we look at it from the point of view that Jessica is the one that figures it out, though, which is my preferred reading of yeah. the film, mm -hmm. <laughs> then she, then the blokes are just bloody useless. <laughs> <laughs> there is something really interesting about her, though. It's and it's a lot because we hear a lot of um, voiceover by her, so we kind of are party to her own internal monologue as she's trying to make sense of things. And there's a really like to to fit into that reading as well there's a lot of her own policing of herself there's a lot yeah. of herself like telling just internally telling herself act normal don't mm -hmm. don't tell them what you're hearing don't tell them what you're seeing it's kind of a lot of not let, making sure that everything looks like it's okay even yeah. when she's having all of these doubts and hearing these creepy voices and encountering um a vampire <laughs> and having all of these doubts about whether Emily Abigail is a is a vampire or a ghost or something in between. Uh, so I I found like like that use of voiceover to fit into this kind of ambiguity as well because yeah. you want to believe her. You're listening to her. You're in her head, and at the same time, you're seeing everyone behave in such coddling and belittling ways and her yeah, she's kind of infantilized yeah. and it happens a lot in i know when we talked about the blood spattered bride mm -hmm. on the last episode you have the husband in that who yeah. you know sends for a doctor he doesn't mm -hmm. listen to his wife he treats her like a child and you often get that in the the sort of gothic tradition in that women are infantilized mm by these male figures and like you said jessica constantly has to police herself and one of my favorite scenes is that highlights this is when they first enter the house and she catches sight of emily mm -hmm. and she's not going to say anything because she thinks it's a hallucination and then her husband's like it's fine i saw it as well and she's got she's like so relieved yeah. and but she's at the same time terrified i mean we don't know what her treatment involved but she's absolutely terrified of being sort of caught out and sent mm -hmm. back there and so she you know is constantly under stress and it sh and it just you know because nobody takes her concern seriously we we listen to like her in a monologue and it like you said it makes you you just really want her to someone to listen to her or, you know, you're just totally on her side, which 
Same with the yellow wallpaper, even though it's quite clear that the, in the yellow wallpaper it's a woman having a nervous breakdown. Yeah. Um, you're still totally on her side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you're you're inside her head. You're inside that room with her. Um, and I wanted to bring up kind of the 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 importance of the location and the remoteness of of the setting because it's very it's very much fodder for horror films especially of this era of this cabin in the woods a remote location in a lake and the film starts and ends with a shot of De of Jessica on this beautiful lake on a rowboat but it's it's kind of tinged with creepiness and eeriness mm. and um i've read a couple of um of of critics who have interpreted this film as being kind of a commentary or satire about hippies uh, of the 60s trying to sort of establish a new way of life or a new kind of society that uh, abides by more inclusive rules and, and whatnot. And I wonder what you thought of kind of how the the setting of the film and them being isolated from everyone else works into this into this eerie eerie atmosphere of it um i don't know if i necessarily agree with those critics mm. i don't know who they were but to me the setting because it was filmed in connecticut it has this brilliant sense of sort of american gothic very specifically american gothic and goth the gothic is always about places character And it's always about isolating a woman from the wider community, be mm -hmm. it in a castle or on some a huge manor house on the Yorkshire Moors. It's always about being stuck in these situations where they can't go and get help from a wider community. They sort of go off. Um, and so to me, it seems quite traditional, but the use of Connecticut specifically, and it's got this wonderful sort of autumnal sort of color palette to it and the way that they use the locations i'm forever complaining that we don't see enough american gothic on screen mm -hmm. we just we don't really see it if you look at the sort of go right back to early horror the universals were doing european gothic and it's mm -hmm. that sort of set the precedent for a European Gothic to sort of dominate. The Draculas, the Frankensteins, the yeah. Wolfman's the only one that's like really American. But we didn't really see the American writers adapted so much. Poe a little bit, but he was always hard to adapt. Lovecraft even more difficult yeah. to adapt. Um, and so we don't generally see a lot of American Gothic until the 70s and 80s. Mm. And so to me... I think that use of that use of place, it it puts it in this very historical uh, sort of space mm -hmm. that we don't generally see explored a lot. And it's such a rich sort of, you know, the whole idea of when we think of uh, American Gothic, we often think of like New England and the Salem yes. witch trials. Absolutely. And, You know, the beautiful architecture mm -hmm. and the, the autumn, because it was filmed in autumn as well. Mm -hmm. And just that whole thing. I think it's absolutely beautiful. So I don't know if it's specifically commenting on something more modern or if it's capturing something much older. I, do, I, I don't know if I agree it's like a, a thing about hippies and their communities because for gothic to really work there has to be some sense of isolation mm. even in something like rosemary's baby which is set slap bang in the middle of the city yeah the main protagonist is still isolated within mm -hmm. this building and the building you know and the inhabitants of the building sort of help like work to isolate her so it just seems like I don't know. It just seems like a typical thing a bunch of middle class hippies would do. Sort of go off, <laughs> buy some old gothic farm, you know, by the lake. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to get your thoughts of what you thought about the ending itself. When in the last like 20 minutes of the film, the creepiness really escalates to 11, uh, whether it was very much more reliant on atmosphere throughout the throughout the majority of the film 
I think it's wonderful because you're not really set up for it. You don't know the first time you see it, you don't know which way it's going to go. And then it starts to get really violent out of nowhere and people start dropping down dead. Mm -hmm. And it, again, it's all from Jessica's perspective. So we don't really know what's happening. So it also has this kind of disconcerting, but almost bewildering atmosphere to it because it's just like whoa like what's going on here and one of my favorite shots is the guy on the what is it the the tractor thing mm -hmm. um, when she's catching running through the uh poisonous spray <laughs> which is like so dangerous the pesticide that yep, her husband yep. didn't even want her to touch an apple you know because a pesticide on it and uh, and she's running through it and then finds this guy who's just been mutilated. Mm. Uh, I just think it's wonderful. It's like really horrific in parts. Um, you know, it's... Uh, I think it was a, the best approach to take rather than... I think that's why it has more of a cult following because mm. it does give that payoff. Like mm -hmm. you expect a payoff and it does pay you off in the last yep. 20 minutes. And the dead bodies start to pile up. <laughs> and um, before we move on to the next film, we've kind of mentioned, and you know, you've just mentioned again that it does have a cult status amongst horror fans. Do you see it having influenced other films that came after it? That's a hard question. No, <laughs> I don't know. No, not really. Messiah of Evil was 73. I wouldn't say that was necessarily influenced by it. I, yeah, but it that has a very similar vibe. And um, and again, that sort of American Gothic aspect. Mm. It's more of a coastal American Gothic with a young woman who's trying to solve a mystery and this town mm. being very strange and more of a zombie film. So I don't know, really. I don't know if I'd say it influenced anything, though. Um, I think it's just not widely not been seen enough, though. Yeah, I do wonder, as as we were speaking, I was thinking about two films, and I, and I don't know if they've been directly influenced by this film, but they have the same kind of tone to it and deal with some of the same themes, I think, particularly with obsessive relationships between women um, and this kind of almost vampiric friendships or vampiric attractions without ever really being direct vampire films in a way that Let's Scare Jessica to Death is. And I was thinking of, I don't know if you've seen Always Shine by Sophia Takal. No, or, I haven't. Or Queen of Earth by No, I'm going to have Ferry. to check these out now. <laughs> they're, they're interesting. And also, as you were talking about the kind of the setting and the sense of isolation that this film gets from its gothic influences, I'm thinking about these films because they're also kind of set in the American forest or the American kind of wilderness, but also are, are essentially quite bougie characters who get a lovely old house in the middle of a beautiful forest and then slowly start going nuts or maybe we're already a little bit nuts before they arrived and it just <laughs> exacerbates everything and it'd be interesting for people to do like a a double or a triple bill with this film and either Always Shine or Queen of Earth because it is very much this like weird melding of two female characters personalities in a slightly horrific way. Yeah, that's really interesting. I'm gonna have to check those out because I love the whole setup. Mm -hmm. I love the the dynamic between Jessica and Emily. It's sort of this love hate, sort of obsessive, it's yeah. it's cloying, it's claustrophobic. Mm. And you know that you know, probably by the end of it, only one of them is gonna <laughs> gonna be able to leave, mm -hmm. and it's like who's got the the strongest will? Yeah, it's like this parasitic attraction where they can't help but want to be around each other, but yeah. one of them will inevitably have to consume the other one. Yeah, it's amazing, and the fact that it's not really explained in Jessica as well. Mm. We don't know why. 
Emily is really so obsessed with Jessica or vice versa. Mm -hmm. It just seems to be this this thing that they have from the first time they meet. Mm. This um yeah, just this this strange thing. Before we move on, the other th mm -hmm. weird thought I thought is the fact that um there's another sort of strange little interpretation that you could make. Uh, when it comes to the sexual aspects and the, another thing about let's scare jessica to death is it rejects the lesbian vampire and it rejects the sexuality and um sex in the film is quite mundane mm -hmm. it's not used t as titillation you know, it's like it stands out in that respect as well but it's almost as if uh, Jessica invites this young woman in mm -hmm. to take that sexual pressure off being alone with two men oh. in a farmhouse, um, which is also really interesting because there's a lot of sex stuff that's never ever talked about, but it's yeah. kind of there. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of flirtation going on and there's a lot of stuff kind of between the lines. Um, and it's a lot of it kind of in the looks, especially the looks that Jessica gives to the flirtations uh, between her husband and Emily, which like it could be jealousy. But I also I'm really into this this interpretation of like, I just want someone to take the pressure off of the the, the, the sexual tension. Yeah, it's almost like like Emily becomes almost like a proxy for her. Mm. Or, um, yeah, there's just so much that's left unsaid. You could literally just sit there just yeah. analysing it in so many different ways, <laughs> which is what makes it so brilliant. You know, for people who want something that's more formulaic, obviously mm. it's probably going to frustrate them. But mm -hmm. to me, the, like I like to mull over these things. Mm. You know, it's like a it's just such a rich film. Really sophisticated in that way. Um, I love low budget horror and especially the low budget horror and exploitation of the 70s and the American stuff. Mm. Um, but there generally wasn't a lot uh, invested in, like you said, like these emotional performances or scripts or, you know, so on and so forth. Whereas Let's Scare Jessica to Death is like really sophisticated. Mm -hmm. For a film of that type, it's just so sophisticated the way that it leaves just so much, like you said, a look or a flirtation or, a, you know, the way that Jessica will be viewing something and then we hear her thoughts on it. I mean, this is is really, really sophisticated. Yeah, and it's very, very dense and but still allows so many different readings. So still allows so much space for the audience to interpret it in many different ways. Like it's almost like watching, you can watch this film four times and feel like you're watching four different films, I think. Yeah, and I think that's why it's what remains one of my favorites because mm. every time I go back to it, and I said this about Daughters of Darkness, but I see <laughs> yeah. something new in it. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the, the best films are always like that. Let's move on now to Vampiros Lesbos from the same year, from 1971. Which is like chalk and cheese. Really. Yeah, truly. <laughs> <laughs> Bestialische Morde im Dunkeln des modernen Istanbuls. Jene geheimnisvollen, jahrtausende alten Stadt im Orient. Lass ihn! Lass ihn Eine gewagte und harte Verfilmung des alten Dracula-Themas, dessen Erbe Schrecken, Entsetzen und Grauen bedeutet. This is... Uh... Chalk and cheese is a very good way of putting it. This is not as sophisticated a film, is it? <laughs> it kind of is, though. It kind of is on on some level. Like, I'm a mm. massive Jess Franco fan, so I realise that not everybody loves Jess Franco. I get it. Um, <laughs> if you're a Jess Franco fan, you quite often meet a lot of confused people mm. um the fact that he made over 200 films as well doesn't 
uh, make it any easier because you quite often find people that have maybe seen some of his weird 90s stuff and they've just kind of written him off. But Vampirus Lesbos was made in his, for me this is, I know every Jas Franco fan is different, but my favourite period of his work where he was working with German producers, Arthur Browner and Karl Heinz Manchen. And he started to become very, very experimental, especially with Gothic. And Franco started out in Gothic, and his take on Gothic was always very strange, which is why I love him. Mm-hmm. Uh, very perverse, yeah. but very weird. And the first, fi- well, the first films that he actually made weren't horror films. Like he made a few films in Spain, like Tenemos Eighteen Años, which is almost like a comedy. It's like a teen comedy, but it's got some really weird scenes in it. Um, <laughs> And also Vampire Essa's 1930, which people would look at the title and think, you know, it's a vampire film. And actually, no, it's like a weird thriller that's uh, that goes into comedy. It's got people in blackface. Like, it's weird. He made a musical, the Lorena de, del Tamb- Tabarin, which is like a really classic Spanish musical. But... In the early 60s, he made The Awful Dr. Orloff, which was mm-hmm. his first Gothic film in France, because obviously they weren't making these sort of films in Spain at the time. And it was his attempt to sort of go against what Hammer and, you know, the more mainstream... Stu- not that Hammer were mainstream at the time, but you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. To kind of go against this very sort of, I guess, uh, sort of buttoned-up, stiff sort of western european gothic uh, and so he made these like really weird s- films in the early 60s so where does vampiros lesbos sit within uh within so, his work vampiros lesbos sort of comes in this period where he really sort of comes into his own i mean not that he wasn't in his own with films like the doctor all off or even the diabolical doctor Z, but you know he starts to become very, very experimental around this period. Um, and he'd just done a, a lot of work with Harry Allen Towers, who's like a British exploitation producer. Mm-hmm. So he did like the Fu Manchu films and he did The Bloody Judge um, and Eugenie, the first Eugenie that he did. Um, but he starts to get very, very... He he just starts to get very experimental in this little pocket. And with the Eugenie, so Eugenie Dessard, Succubus, which he made before this, Venus in Furs, which was one of his Harry Allen Towers films. Um, A very, very strange take, but wonderful, dreamy take on the, the original novella that's nothing like the original novella. And he starts to develop a lot of his key themes and a lot of people especially sort of modern viewers say they they come across jess franco's films like he loved bush Mm -hmm. he loved filming close-ups of bush he loved tits he loved (laughs) women (laughs) he loved sex um but there was always something very uh to me anyway this has just been my experience with the films um Something very empowering about uh, his main female protagonist, especially mm. Soledad Miranda, yes. who's in Vampire Says Boss. She plays the And then later, Lena Rome, mm-hmm. who became his muse, and then it was his lifetime partner after that, mm. his collaborator, and they eventually married and were together until she died. Where... A lot of the sex in in these films c- comes from the the woman. Mm-hmm. It's um it's very confrontational, and it's um and it's. I know his cinema is very voyeuristic, but there's a certain sense of like a sex positive sort of power in there. Mm-hmm. Um, not that he's ever sort of called a feminist director, but some of the things that he did, including Vampire Slayer's Boss, um, I think were. Because when we look at the vampire film, and we talked about this on Daughters yeah. of Darkness, um, 
traditionally in film, it was very male. It was about male predators. Mm -hmm. It was about the women would often be brainwashed or, you know, these maiden types. There's an extremely blurry line with um, vampires and consent. Yeah, so it's like, you know, and and then the 70s comes along and it kind of opens up. Mm. And so you have all this experimentation in the female vampire film. Jess Franco had already made Count Dracula with Harry Ann Towers, mm -hmm. um, which is more of a classic version of the tale and was apparently Christopher Lee's favourite version of it, which he insists was the most faithful, which I'm not necessarily going to agree with him, but um, because he gets white hair at the beginning of the film. But he was allowed to talk a lot in it, so he loved it. <laughs> and Soledad Miranda was in that as Lucy. Mm. Um, and that was more classic, more traditional, just in a very Jess Franco way. But when he gets to Vampiros Lesbos, he basically he does the the un, like the unspeakable thing. He doesn't use Carmela, although he uses aspects of it. He doesn't stick to the fem ready-made female vampires. He steals the plot of Dracula, but he he makes the Count Dracula figure played by Soledad Miranda, who is, like, given a name that's sort of linked to Countess Bathory. Yeah, it's Countess Carady. Carady. Yeah. <laughs> so, but he, so, but he makes the Dracula figure female. Mm -hmm. And not only that, she's not scared of the sun. She's not scared of crosses. She's not scared of, you know... So when we first meet her, well, she's dancing in a strip club, when we meet her as the, the Countess, she's in a white bikini sunbathing. Mm -hmm. Now, that, to me, is like one of the most transgressive things that was ever done in the whole of that 70s vampire thing. Uh, and then you get Jonathan Harker is a female character as well, played by Eva Stromberg, who has to go out to see the Countess to sort out this paperwork. Um, and so, to me, it's such a fuck you this film to that really sort of male dominated dracula dominated thing mm. that he brought vampires out into the sun i mean and made them female and put them in a bikini and put them in a bikini <laughs> and so i just i love jess i there's so many things in his gothic that i adore but vampires lesbos has always been one of my favorites it's always when I say to people, watch that first. <laughs> Just watch that one. <laughs> and one of the striking things about it is that, like you say, it's a very light, it's very light, it's very beachy. Um, it's very colour-filled take on vampires. There's almost no darkness in this film. No. And there's a lot of sex, or at least there's a lot of uh, foreplay. And I was wondering kind of what you think of the way that actually he eroticizes the vampires in this film. Well, vampires have always been erotic. Mm. I mean, even Dracula. Yeah. And, you know, there's that scene when Mina Harker sort of, you know, he cuts his chest and, you know, it's all this sort of unspoken thing. Yeah. But, but this, really this, is made, <laughs> this is made into softcore, basically. Yeah. Jess really sort of took that to its natural conclusion and even more so with a female vampire, which I absolutely love, where he has the main vampire character in that. He's played by Lena Rome. Uh, she doesn't suck blood. She sucks uh, men seminal fluids <laughs> and there's a hardcore cut of that because Jess would quite often I mean he'd done 99 women before this which had had hardcore inserts mm. a lot of his films weren't just softcore they'd go into hardcore as well and like Jean Roland he used he used the vampire to make it very very sexy and very very gra graphic now I love European Euro sleaze, you know, all that sort of stuff. So for me, it's perfect. But I do know that I have actually seen sort of newer viewers on Twitter mm -hmm. uh, sort of tweeting along when some of these films came on Netflix. Yeah. 
in the American Netflix, very confused <laughs> <laughs> what they were watching. Why do you think that would be confusing for contemporary viewers? I think because the vampire's always been about sex, but to actually see it so graphically, I think is still quite shocking to some viewers. Mm. You know, people that grew up on the Lost Boys and near dark or whatever you know you don't get a naked woman in thigh length boots with a huge bush you don't and the (laughs) bush in franco's films are amazing like he worshipped the bush so you get these big sort of like these sort of extreme zooms into (laughs) a woman's bush which knowing how much bush in and of itself annoys some certain men today i just i just love that he did that there's this, um, I seem to speak about it a lot with my co-host on Daughters of Darkness, Sam uh-huh. Deegan. This strange uh, group of men of a certain age who get very upset if Bush appears in a film. Uh, they're just very, very upset about it. Uh, it's just so provocative. I think it's it's... Just um, the other thing about the way sex is portrayed in Franco's films, though, is the women are always stronger. It's always about their desire. And this was certainly the case when it came to Lena Rome, who Mm. obviously enjoyed the exhibitionist. uh, And he was still putting her in softcore when she was in her 50s, mm-hmm. which is, again, sort of quite transgressive. I'm not yeah. supposed to do that. How dare you put an yeah. older woman in? <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. It's it's po- it's possibly even more transgressive now than even at that time. Which is wonderful. I think he broke so many boundaries, but you can't remove him from... <clears throat> I know we talked about this on Blood Spat a Bride, but the whole Spanish context. Mm-hmm. You know, Jess Franco came out of Franco is Spain. He escaped. He went to France to start making films and yeah. then later Britain and then with German investors. Um, and to put sex in, and not just sex, but softcore sex in, in a you know, a Spanish horror film, even though it wasn't produced, really, although Vampire's Lesbos was Mm -hmm. co-production. To put sex in in a Spanish film or for a Spanish filmmaker to do that was like, that was like so subversive for the time. I think to Jack, there was always an element of his films that he was a maverick. He was against the fascist state, the Catholicism, the repression. You can't remove that from the way that he worked and what he was obsessed with. Mm. You know, had he been an American filmmaker or even a British filmmaker, I think his films might have had different connotations. But it was almost like a political statement in a way that he was just all for sex and freedom you know came Mm. from a very specific cultural background and you can't remove him from that you know so it was very daring what he did as Mm. well and the fact that he would always go that much further than a lot of Mm. his peers beyond um, I mean John Roland is probably the only one that come and Jose Larras another Spanish filmmaker Yep, all the all the Spanish filmmaking pervs. Yeah, we love them. Um, but but... <laughs> pervs are good to me. Certain pervs are good. Oh, I say it as a, <laughs> as a compliment. <laughs> um, but it's interesting that we've talked a lot about um, the erotic and the sexual aspects of of his work in general, his obsessions and interests, and how he films women and women's bodies and sexuality in this film, but. How do you think he deals with the horror aspect in in Vampiros Lesbos? I don't think he was that interested in horror, yeah. to be honest. Even though he made horror films, he, in the Dr. Orloff films, for mm. example, he's much more interested in the idea of obsession, mm-hmm. perversion, the idea of somebody being... Uh, you know this mad love sort of strand, which you get in you get in Vampirus Lesbos, mm-hmm. like the Countess becomes obsessed with Linda, who's uh, Eva Stromberg's character, and she uses this Carmilla thing to get into her head, so she can project into her dreams and 
Eva's, um, uh, well, sorry, Linda, Linda Westinghouse, <laughs> uh, she starts to have these erotic dreams about Soledad Miranda, and it's, uh, it's, it seems to fall into a lot of his earlier work, this recurring theme of obsession, but the actual, like, gore, I mean, he made horror horror films in the 80s like bloody moon faceless i don't think he was that interested though like jean roland who also wasn't that interested in horror horror mm -hmm. you know he was more interested in the aspects of, of sort of the perverse and the more romantic aspects as well that you find mm -hmm. in gothic vampire slesbos sort of call aside is also romantic like a gothic romance yeah and i was gonna ask you actually about your thoughts on the obsession between the two key characters between um linda and the countess yeah it's a weird sort of obsession it's not played out the same way as jessica yeah no not uh, at all it, it does ha it seems more consensual for a start mm -hmm. in, and Linda's character, as, yeah, it's Linda. Linda's character is much more interesting in terms of, um, no, not maybe not much more interesting. Linda's character has much more agency than Jessica. So she, and, and she's presented as somebody who's very repressed. And again, you have this like gaslighting thing in it that, her husband sort of like an adult she's got that psychiatrist mm -hmm. he's like oh i think you need a holiday <laughs> you know you just need to have a rest they do the same thing but yeah. she is she has a lot more agency than jessica and she's a lot she's a lot stronger character and she is in this relationship that seems really boring mm -hmm. and then she meets soledad miranda and she just she's just like whoa like, you know, I can't stop thinking about this woman. Mm -hmm. You have, like, the um, the romance aspect from the Countess's point of view as well, where she wants to give everything up. She falls in love with Linda and admits to that, and it makes her vulnerable. And I know some vampire films, especially certain Dracula adaptations, use that, um, but it completely takes it away from horror then and it becomes something else it becomes like a doomed romance because one's a human and one's like a vampire and it's like you know that it's not going to end well so i think the way he handles it is really interesting because it's it's tragic it's romantic mm. uh, a lot more tragic and romantic than some of his other films like he uses the theme of obsession quite a lot but it's quite interesting how he uses it here is a gothic like doomed romance that these two women or vampire and woman mm -hmm. as soon as they meet it's like they can't be apart um and it's all about their relationship and um you know how linda outside of being with the countess is very repressed mm. and the countess is very lonely and isolated and so their relationship becomes really important to them um, when, you know, Linda's relatives aren't trying to get a sectioned, mm. that is. You've got the boyfriend. Well, I, c I can't remember the boyfriend's name, but he's like this total non-entity. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to ask you as well about, we've talked briefly about Dracula and how he's essentially reinvented as the Countess here but he does actually appear in this film which uh, took me by surprise because yes. <laughs> he's just like this douchey looking disco dude with sunglasses and I might be wrong but I don't think he speaks throughout the whole film no and she talks about him yeah. she actually, the Countess talks about how he made her mm -hmm. so it gives you this other level of this other weird sort of backstory that seems to have come from an Anne Rice novel before <laughs> Anne Rice it's, yeah. like, it's like the same thing with the Lestat and Louis and the one who made me and all that sort of stuff um, and I can't think of that being used in a film before this and 
I can't remember what year Interview with the Vampire was written, but that was like early, so mid-70s, 76. It was, it was 76 or 78. Yeah, it was 76. definitely after this. So, you know, after this, I'm not saying Anne Rice saw a Vampire as a Lesbos and, and suddenly went out. And <laughs> no, I don't <laughs> think so. But it de- like Dracula is supposed to be, have been like, you know, she's been under Dracula's control and, you mm-hmm. know, so she wants this new relationship and she knows that she can't. Uh, and it's just, again, so many layers in there and really, really interesting how he interprets things. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jess Franco is also in it as a pervert, Mehmet, <laughs> <laughs> which I love. He knows his talents. He knows where his talents lie. Yeah, I mean, he often appeared in his mm-hmm. own films, but Mehmet is one of my favourite Jess Franco cameos. <laughs> How so? Because he's just so gross and disgusting <laughs> and kind of like... <laughs> and he'd often do that. He'd give himself these mm. sort of, you know... Either that or he'd be playing piano in a jazz club. <laughs> And um, to bring both of these films together, um, watching them back to back, one of the things that I found really interesting, but they deal with it kind of very differently, is um, they approach the the obsessive relationships between the vampire and the woman that they're obsessed with as kind of almost hauntings. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering kind of what you make of this of this amalgamation of vampires and ghosts. Well, Carmina, which was written before Dracula, was always... Lefani always used that aspect, maybe not as a ghost, but as a haunting. In the in the original novella, the the Carmina character has been haunting the protagonist since childhood, and she's able to enter people's dreams. Um, and the Velvet Vampire, which uh, I know you're doing mm-hmm. an episode on, sort of uses that as well. And so Jess uses that quite ex- explicitly in Vampirous Lesbos because we see Linda go to the psychiatrist and talk about her weird dreams. Uh, with Jessica, we don't know how the uh, the... Um, like Emily character. I never know what to call her. Emily Abigail. We don't really know how she gets to her because it's not really made explicit. But Jess isn't... Jess is, is sort of uses it, actually minds the Carmela vein. Um, and uh, I just find it really fascinating because... It goes along with that whole vampires being able to control people and get into mm-hmm. their heads, which I, I kind of like that power. I like it when it comes up. Yeah. Seems like a cool power to have. Um, but the way it's used in Vampires Lesbos, isn't, it starts off as manipulative, but it ends up not manipulative because mm-hmm. you actually believe the Countess has genuine feelings for Linda by the end of it whereas mm-hmm. the Carmina like traditional Carmina she she haunts people she attaches herself she's more like a ghost mm-hmm. and then she and then she drains them more like an emotional vampire than almost a, a blood sucking yeah, one yeah a definite emotional aspect to it but it's it's not like that in this it becomes more of a uh, I guess a, like an empowerment from sexual uh, repression because Linda's supposed to be this very repressed woman at the mm-hmm. beginning um, with a very Freudian psychiatrist <laughs> Kat I'm aware that we've been talking for over an hour now so oh wow yeah <laughs> is there anything about either one of these films that we haven't touched on that you wanted to say before we wrap up no, other than um, I hope more people go out and watch them. I think mm. Jess Franco in particular. Mm-hmm. Um, people hear about Jess Franco and they often base their opinion on of Jess Franco on things they've heard. Or like mm-hmm. I said, on one film they might have seen and usually yeah. it's fucking Zombie Lake or something. <laughs> like, you know, And it's like... But the consensus seems to be when people see this film, they're really surprised by it. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, in that sort of, 
oh, Jess Franco, I thought, I always heard he was a bit shit, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's like, this is really artistic. So I just really hope more people give them a chance. And obviously Jessica's a lot easier to see now as well. Mm -hmm. I think they're both really good examples of just what you can do with the idea of a vampire. If you look back to very early fiction, sort of pre-Dracula, you would have these vampiric tales, like the tale of the 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 mythology of Lilith, for example, mm -hmm. which I love. Yes. You know, this idea that there's this goddess who yeah. defied Adam and can suck the marrow from newborn babies and she's a succubus. You know, so you find that in in in, in romantic era fiction, in the French fantastique, they have a for example, the writer uh, Jean Laran used vampirism in a, in this more haunting way as a metaphor for drug abuse, for mm -hmm. syphilis. Um, and there's so much you can do with a vampire, I think, as these two films prove. I think because of film, and again, this isn't a criticism because I love the old Universal gothics and I love the Hammer films. But there is this like overwhelming expectation that a vampire can only be one thing. And I think if the 70s taught us anything, it's that, no, it can, the vampire can be many things. I mean, by the end of the 70s, you're getting films like Rabid and Martin, mm. which are like totally blowing the tropes out of the water. Yes. Um, and it starts in films like this, maybe mm -hmm. not so much in Vampirous Lesbos, which was more of a, a move towards stronger female characters. But in Jessica, yes, you know, it it showed just how ambiguous a vampire can be. And it doesn't necessarily have to be about crosses and garlic and all the things they kind of send up in what we do in the shadows, which I love mm -hmm. to, to pieces sort of lovingly send up, mm -hmm. you know, they show you that the vampire has so many other possibilities, um, uh, just that they've been rarely mined up until that point in cinema. So, like, you know, they might not be classic, but that's a good thing to me, you know. You mm -hmm. can get too much of the classic, I think, then they just become, you know what's going to happen. Kat, thank you so much for no, your you. time. Thank you for having me back. It's, it's always like, brilliant yeah. to hear your insight on, <laughs> on these films that you so clearly adore. I do. I love vampires. If only I could just find someone to turn me. <laughs> um, you know, then my life's work would have <laughs> been something. <laughs> well, maybe a modern day Carmilla is listening to this podcast. <laughs> but um, where can people find more of your work online? So you can find me at diabolikemagazine.com and also on Patreon under Cat Ellinger's Confessions of a Cine Slut. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's it for this episode of the Final Girls podcast. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you get your shows. If you can, please do leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. You can also find out more about what we do on thefinalghost.co.uk. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook at thefinalghost.uk. And you can also follow Kat and, and you can also follow Kat on Twitter at Kat underscore Diabolique. And I am Anna B. Demented. Thank you for listening. And we'll be back with some more horny vampire goodness next week. <laughs>